this stock will be uh, uh, less high level than yesterday's. Uh, in fact, I'm going to violate all sorts of good rules about how to uh, to give a good colloquium here. I, uh, well, I'm going to tell you about these uh, two amazing uh, uh, twins polynomials, uh, the terminant and the permanent, and I'm going to cram a lot of material in it a lot of material of different nature, so it will require lots of context switching. Uh, I'm going to do some proofs, or actually sketches of proofs. Uh, and uh, so, so in some sense, it's too dense. Uh, I hope that uh, each of you will get you know, some of the details, and all of you will get uh, the, the correct impression that uh, well, you may have known that the determinant was important in mathematics, so that I'm sure you, you may learn why it is so important. Uh, and uh, about the permanent function, which is less well known, I want to sort of make sure that you understand it should be much more, much better known, and uh, it captures an, an enormous number of things. So let me start. Uh, still, I welcome questions, please uh, ask, and we don't have to cover the whole thing. Oh. Um, so we are going to work over some field, uh, you know, of characteristics different than two, because it's this characteristic two permanent that determinant are the same, same polynomial. Uh, these ma polynomials will be polynomials of a matrix X, uh, n by n matrix over the field. And uh, you know this, uh, at least the first one, the determinant of the matrix is just has this very simple expression, sum over all permutations, and then the product of the monomial corresponding to it, the diagonal corresponding to it with the sign. The permanent, its sibling is uh, exactly the same without the sign. So uh, look very much alike structurally. They're all homogeneous, uh, multilinear, the degree n in this n squared variables, and have very simple coefficients, zero. And so, what is there to say about them? So, I, I'll give you one slide version of the whole talk. Actually, the talk will have even more than that, but just some of the different uh, arenas where uh, uh, they show up. So, here are the determinant and the permanent. So they show up in physics. I don't know how many people are aware of that, but uh, and we'll talk about it uh, uh, more a little later. Uh, in some very precise sense, the determinant captures how you know and the identical fermions behave. Uh, these are elementary particles, uh, and uh, permanent somehow captures how bosons behave, which will be very peculiar, as you'll see. They appear in knot theory. Uh, you know, Alexander polynomial is basically evaluated by a determinant, where the Jones polynomial is evaluated by uh, the permanent. And that will also is sort of peculiar. Everybody likes the Jones polynomial much better than the Alexander polynomial because it's uh, you know more descriptive. But it's uh, you know as you see, it's harder because the permanent is not so easy to compute. Uh, you know, where do you use these uh, polynomials where uh, determinant is all over the place? It's uh, the core function for everything in linear algebra, has a, a strong geometric interpretation, has a volume uh, of bodies. And uh, you see it, you know, I mean, it's very hard to find an uh, algebra text, but, you know, algebra text without determinant. So uh, not just algebra, I mean, PDs and uh, I don't know, anywhere. Uh, and as I said in the beginning, uh, there is a reason for that, so I'll try to explain what the reason is. Uh, on the other hand, the permanent uh, turns out that its you know sort of main uh, function is to count objects, and we'll see how enumeration counting <laughs> problems are, are encoded in the permanent. Uh, it is very important in statistical mechanics. Uh, many, many of these counting problems or you know ar arise in this uh, context, and it's hugely important in computational complexity. And I'll tell you about some results, and I have to skip many others. But it's absolutely primary uh, for us in complexity theory. Uh, both of them count things, so but uh, somehow determinant count simple things like. Uh, number of spanning trees of a graph or a number of planar matchings, uh, pl matchings in planar graphs where permanent, more or less by definition, counts the number of perfect matchings in a graph. And as we'll see, it actually is the ultimate counting, prob uh, counting problem. It's 
captures all counting problems you can imagine. So we'll talk about this. Uh, and the, the main dichotomy between them is the computational complexity dichotomy, which is uh, the terminal we know is easy to compute, whereas the permanent function we think is very hard. This manifests itself in some completeness results we'll see. Uh, for Boolean, for thinking about computation of these uh, polynomials over, over some discrete domains, this one is complete for a very low class, low complexity class, I'll show you in the next slide, and where the permanent is, uh, you know, is complete for a much higher class above NP. And there's also an arithmetic version of this. There is an arithmetic version of uh, P and NP introduced by Valiant, and it turns out that the terminant is complete for P, for this version of P, and permanent is complete for the analog for NP. So let's look at this complexity uh, world a second uh, a little better. So yeah, as I said, we'll, we'll talk about this everything and everywhere. Uh, this completeness results, in fact, capture them, but we'll see the, the appropriate statements for both. So I'm sure that, uh, yeah, just to get everybody on the same complexity page, uh, we study in computational complexity, we study problems according to the, how difficult it is to compute them. And uh, we have this uh, uh, separating barrier between the things we can actually do, namely solving polynomial time efficiently, uh, these are the easy problems, and uh, what we call hard, is these are problems complete for NP and above, uh, these are problems for which uh, we know efficient verification. Uh, NP is a class for which we have efficient verification, but we don't know uh, how to search for you know, objects, the proofs of uh, theorems, say. And Permanent determinants sit, in fact, you know, the terminal is very low in the easy functions and permanent is very high in the hard functions. And uh, if you want to know more precisely where it is, you have to, to learn about more complexity classes. And here are some uh, that sit uh, you know, straight of this line. So uh, below P, there are, uh, the, what can be done in very small space and slightly above it, something that, you know, all problems that have really not just efficient algorithms, but efficient parallel algorithms. And the terminant is complete for that. So it's, it's much easier than a you know, typical problem in P. On the other hand, uh, the permanent function is complete for a class called Sharpie, which is a counting version of problems in NP. And uh, so it's, it's quite a bit higher, and we'll see, uh, uh, well, actually, I have it. Uh, so it sits not only above NP, but uh, uh, NP is, uh, you know, sort of a one quantifier uh, kind of statement if you think about first order logic. There exists, uh, you know, a clique, or there exists a Hamiltonian tour, or there exists a satisfying assignment. Uh, polynomial hierarchy is about statements of the form there exists for all, there exists for all, for a finite number of uh, alternations. And all of these are easier than uh, problems uh, like the permanent. Uh, another uh, thing that sits below, and we'll see it uh, in more detail, is uh, the class of everything that can be done efficiently on a quantum computer. It turns out that this is also easier than. Uh, the so the permanent is pretty high up there. It really you know, captures a lot. And these are just uh, the Boolean complexity classes, classes of uh, discrete functions. When you think about arithmetic computation, as I mentioned before, these guys are complete for the two analogs of P and NP, the VP, valiance P, and valiance NP. And we'll, we'll see this too. So... I'm going to start actually with the arithmetic version, then go to the uh, Boolean slowly and uh, do a few other things. So I want to talk first about arithmetic computation. How do you just compute formal polynomials uh, using plus and times, you know, just addition and multiplication? So here are the basics you need to know. Uh, working over some field and, uh, you know, a circuit or a, basically a program is uh, anything that looks like this. You take the variables of your polynomial and you take maybe constants in the field and then you apply a series of additions, multiplications, 
and this is supposed to compute your polynomial. And the complexity measure is uh, how small can such a circuit be, such a program be. Okay, so that's S of F. Circuit size, there's a more uh, mathematically familiar object than a circuit, uh, which is namely a formula. Actually, uh, let me just uh, say that I'm going to only consider polynomials if they have n variables, polynomials of degree n or n squared, something like that, not like exponential degree. Like permanent and determinant. Uh, so formulas are just like circuits, only that they are not allowed to reuse uh, uh, partial computations, so they have to look like a tree. Everything you want to compute again, you have to compute again. Uh, formulas are what, what we see in, uh, you know, in math. Just, uh, you, know, you can replace the parentheses by a tree representation like that. So it's also a universal model. It can compute every polynomial, but it's less efficient. So uh, this L of F will denote formula size, and it's always at most uh, circuit size. And it turns out that it's not much smaller. It's, uh, it, there's a very important theorem saying that the uh, uh, formula size is, uh, of course, it's at least a circuit size, but it's not much bigger than circuit size, up to uh, you know, just quasi-polynomial in, uh, in the circuit size. So that's all you need to know about uh, complexity. Of course, what we are interested in you know, are, are polynomial, you know, which polynomials have small circuits, small formula, and which don't. That's what we want to understand. Uh, so we'll talk about what uh, can be said about determinant and then what can be said about uh, permanent, in particular the completeness of determinant and completeness of the permanent. So determinant, I think everybody knows that uh, it has an efficient computation. It has a small circuit of size n cube computing it for n by n uh, determinant. It's not as obvious as uh, you might think, because uh, if I ask anybody uh, how to do it, the uh, immediate answer is Gaussian elimination, which takes n cubed operations. But Gaussian elimination has division, and division did not appear in my circuit. So even if you don't allow division, it turns out that uh, you can do it just in, in the same amount of, you don't really need division. Uh, and so it's efficient in this model. And in terms of formula size, the best we know is uh, slightly quasi-polynomial, n to the log n size formula. That's also highly non-trivial. I challenge anybody here that didn't see that to, to find such a formula for the determinant. Of course, the obvious expansion of determinant has size n factorial. So, you know, uh, and similarly, if you just take this circuit, of n cube circuit and unravel it, make it a tree, it will also become exponential. So it's a non-trivial. Uh, bound. So anyway, determinant is easy to compute e by circuits and by formulas. And the main result... Yes, and it does for Thank you. It does follow from the general result I had on the last slide, which came after this was proved. <laughs> yeah, it was a generalization of this result. Thanks. Uh, and yeah, so the completeness uh, statement I want to, to tell you about is this one by Valiant. It says that if you have any formula computing some polynomial, let's say a formula of size s, okay, then that polynomial is captured as a determinant of a matrix that's roughly s by s and has only variables and constants in its entries. So again, any polynomial you know, represented by some formula, you can represent it as a determinant. And this is the reason why you see determinants of all, all over the place. They are, uh, you know, they are as useful as formulas, sometimes more convenient to work with. And uh, so you shouldn't be surprised that you, uh, uh, you see such representations. People are studying the determinantal representations of uh, polynomials in commutative algebra, for example. Uh, so here is a very general statement that says it's always possible. Of course, they sometimes look for more precise characterizations. But anyway, let me tell you what the completeness result is. Uh, again, if you have a formula of size s for some polynomial, then there is a 2s by 2s matrix of variables and constants which, uh, uh, whose determinant is that polynomial. Okay, so let me give you this proof. That will be the first proof we'll see. I mean, just a couple of minutes, but it's really beautiful. Uh, 
And it's not trivial in that you, know, you need an idea. Once you have the idea, you, you, know, you realize it, it was really easy, <laughs> like many things we discover, right? Uh, hindsight is everything. So how would you prove something about formulas? Almost everything you prove by induction on the structure of the formula, right? So we'll do it too. Uh, induction. So a formula, you know, its top gate is either a multiplication or addition. So it's either G plus H or V times H. And let's assume we already have constructed matrices whose determinants are respectively G and H. Okay? So here is a matrix whose determinant is G. Here is a matrix whose determinant is H. How do you get the matrix whose determinant is G times H? You don't need anything, right? Yeah, you feel zeros everywhere else, and that's really easy. So that will be the matrix for uh, F, and, uh, and uh, you know, its determinant is obviously the product. Good. So somehow then you, you say, OK, this was easy. Let's do this. But uh, then you sort of you start scratching your head. And if you've never seen, seen it before, you probably scratch your head for a while. It's not obvious. And the key idea uh, in, in doing that is actually impose more structure in the induction and demand that you know, these matrices whose determinant is the appropriate polynomial have some structure. In particular, you want it to be almost triangular. So you want uh, it sort of upper triangular, except that one diagonal below the main diagonal will have all ones. Okay. So you ensure it for G. You ensure it for H. And you look at it, and it, uh, you know when you look at the matrix for F, it doesn't quite look right because there's some something missing there, a one. So you put it in. It doesn't doesn't make any difference. So it's still the determinant of uh, the big matrix is a product of the two determinants. But this structure is going to help us a lot when we do addition. So let's do addition. Uh, yeah, you have to also make such, you know, the basis of the induction is also important, but it's easy. Uh, let's do addition. So addition, we do the same and see what happens. Of course, this does not compute the, the sum of the determinants. In order to compute the sum, you add the one row and one column. And you put, you know, put ones here and here in the column, one, one, here. And here in this uh, first row, and the reason the determinant of this simple matrix is the sum of the determinant, I may be forgetting some signs, but uh, the reason is that basically these ones, you know, if you just expand the determinant according to, let's say, the first column, you have to take either this guy or this guy. You see that if you take this guy, you are really forced to take all these guys and this one. And so you get one plus you know, one times the determinant of H, and the other way will give you one so it's just addition. So this is a programming with determinants, 101. That's a proof. So uh, again, the summary is that uh, determinant is complete for uh, formulas. So what's the statement for, uh, oh, sorry, nobody caught me. This does not have the structure that I promised, right? It does not have this uh, ones on the uh, off diagonal because this annoying one is here. But actually, if you just switch these two rows, you fix everything. So you can get the inductive assumption back. OK. I want to talk about, uh, yes. Yeah, they end up being very sparse. What, what will happen is that uh, uh, there'll be no more than logarithmic number of non-zeros per row. What about the permanent? So the permanent turns out to be complete for a much richer class of polynomials. So here is the definition, valence definition. What is the class VNP? And every integer polynomial in these variables uh, with the following simple property. You just consider all monomials, since we said we take degree at most polynomial in n. Let's say polynomial in n variables of degree at most n. There are exponentially many potential monomials. And for each one, you want to know its coefficient. What you require for this polynomial to be VNP, that every coefficient can be efficiently computed. There is a, you know, a fast algorithm to tell you 
which, uh, you know, what is the coefficient of each monomial given the monomial. So suddenly, you know, determinant and permanent are, are in V and P. If, you, if I give you a monomial, you know whether this, in, in this, uh, the variables, you know whether uh, it's a zero or one or minus one. And many others are like that. In fact, I claim that everything that, every polynomial that people invent is in VNP, okay? You can check yourself all the polynomials you care about. Uh, you can make sure that they are uh, in VNP. So despite the fact that there are exponentially many monomials, we, what, all, we, all we require is that we can tell wh for each uh, monomial what's the coefficient. So it captures essentially all polynomials that mathematics cares about and uh, lots of other fields. Uh, and what Valiant showed is that the permanent captures them all, okay? So if you take any such polynomial, F, in this class, then there is a permanent, uh, you know, there is a matrix, again, with variables and, uh, and uh, constants, I would say with polynomial size, that uh, whose permanent compute is polynomial. Okay, so it's a much, much richer class, VNP. We'll see some examples, but uh, uh, the statement, I, this I'm not going to show you the proof of, it's much more complicated, one of the most sophisticated completeness reductions we know. Uh, so it's, it's quite involved, but anyway, the statement is again that the permanent is extremely rich in expressiveness, it captures any, any reasonable polynomial you would define. And these two completeness results bring us to a very natural uh, uh, way of handling the algebraic analog of the p versus np problem. After all, this uh, one problem, permanent is complete for the hard problems and determinant is complete for the easy problem. So to ask whether you know, np equals p in this arithmetic setting, you just ask whether you can translate permanent into determinant. This is a, uh, that's the only thing you need to understand. So what do I mean translate? We just think of affine projection. So you want to take uh, matrices of uh, size n to matrices of size k for some maybe larger k, and you call such an affine map good if you know the permanent of the matrix here turns out to be the determinant of the new matrix, the new k by k matrix. Okay, so you apply affine transformation to the variables and then you compute the determinant and bang, you compute at the permanent. And so the question is, the main complexity question is, you know, how, how large a k do you need? Or how small a k can you get? So k of n will be the smallest k for which you, you have such a good map, such a good uh, projection. Uh, so what do we know about this? Uh, Polya, you know, asked this question uh, long ago after he observed that it's very easy to do for two by two matrices. Right, you just change the sign of one of the entries and the <laughs> permanent becomes a determinant. He also noticed that it doesn't work for three by three, so you, know, you need larger uh, things. So what do we know? First of all, by valiance completeness of the determinant, you can always do it. It's not, actually not obvious that there is a finite bound, that you, you can always do it, but you can do it. However, that's exponential blow up and we cannot afford it. What's the best lower bound that uh, was recently uh, proved the quadratic lower bound? So you cannot do it without blowing up the size of the matrix quadratically. Okay. And that's a simple, uh, yeah, I mean, the spirit of algebraic geometric, but it's a, it's a, a simple statement of the Hessian of you know, the permanent. Uh, and the important thing, so we have this lower and upper bound. The question is, you know, is there a polynomial upper bound or not? And the completeness result of these two, the two completeness results tell you that if you care about uh, this P, VP different than VNP, the question is simply is whether this bound is polynomial or not. So prove super polynomial lower bounds. You, you separated these classes. This is a, would be a major result in uh, computational complexity. And uh, we don't know, I mean, we're working on it. And in a particular way of working on it was introduced about a decade ago by Malmali and Sohoni. This is called the geometric complexity theory. I know there are some algebraic geometers in this crowd. 
uh, and uh, some of them got involved in this. So the, the idea here is that uh, both of these polynomials, uh, another feature I didn't mention, is that they are completely defined by their symmetries. So there are some symmetries, some group action on the, on the underlying uh, variables that preserve them. And they are the only ones preserved by these respect, two respective groups of transformations. So once you have this uh, structure, it's very natural to apply invariant theory and representation theory and try to you know, show that uh, they are separated, that uh, you know, a good map of uh, flow k cannot, cannot exist. And that's the spirit of this uh, attack. Uh, so what do we know in terms of hardness? So that, that's an approach that we, you know, uh, or general circuit law bounds, which that's what it will mean, we, we still don't have. So I want to tell you just a little bit about restricted law bounds we know for the permanent. We know it's hard for some models. If you tie several hands of the model behind its back, then uh, we know that it's hard. So, and somehow uh, it's sort of disappointing that in these restricted models, every lower bound we have for the permanent also applies for the determinant, so, which means that these models are not very strong. But anyway, let me mention a few. Uh, if you move to the non-commutative regime, if your set of variables is uh, actually non-commuting variables, then uh, computer, you can still define arithmetic circuits in the same way. And here, at least for formulas, we have a, a truly exponential lower bound for both of them. We don't know any lower bound in this setting for, uh, for uh, circuits. Uh, Back to commutative variables, uh, these polynomials are multilinear. You can ask to compute them by multilinear circuits or formulas, namely ones which, in which you don't have monomials of degree where the variable has degree more than one. And here there's a fantastic lower bound, uh, fantastic in the you know, beauty of the technique. We, we can ask for more. It's just quasi-polynomial, and we can ask for exponential, but uh, uh, it's the strongest, really, the strongest lower bound we have in this. Uh, uh, and it applies for both. And the most recent, and it's a very active field, and uh, just the last couple of years, uh, we had uh, another series of results that I'll tell you the culmination of. Uh, in another, yet another restricted model. And this is a, this is a model where you have, uh, you, you look at circuit size, but you restrict the depth of the circuit, you know, the distance from the inputs to the output to be four. Okay, so here's something really interesting. Uh, there's a lower bound of n to the root n on the size of such restricted depth circuits for the terminant. And this is the best you can get because there's an upper bound of the same quality. Whereas for permanent, of course, the same lower bound works also for the permanent. But it turns out that if you beat it just by a little bit, if you push this square root n in the exponent to any faster function, then you have uh, achieved, again, separating VP from VNP. Somehow that we are really at the barrier of potentially separating it. And the techniques that uh, go in here are at the end, they are linear algebraic, but they again inspired by algebraic geometry, and they talk about uh, you know applying various differential forms to the uh, to these functions and the circuits that compute them. Questions? I'm switching topics. I want to talk about uh, some really uh, nice properties of uh, permanent, actually of the terminant too, but it will be useful that we have it for the permanent and uh, complexity theoretic consequences of these uh, properties. And these uh, are properties about how permanent relates to itself, OK? So I'll explain what it means. There'll be two of them, or maybe three. Uh, the first one is uh, really simple. It's what's called the permanent is downward self-reducible. Downward means that permanence of n by n matrices can be efficiently computed if you are given you know, some algorithm that does it for smaller matrices than n. Okay? This follows directly from the row expansion of the permanent. Right? The permanent, like the determinant, you can expand it by row. So you take the first row, you know, it's just uh, this inner product. You know, take 
each one of the variables and multiply by the permanent of the minor that it defines. So if you have, uh, you know, you want to solve n by n permanence, then it's enough to ask n questions, an algorithm that solves n minus 1 by n minus 1 permanence. Okay. So that's a simple property, but it, it turns out to be extremely useful. We'll, we'll get back to it. Uh, the other property is random self-reducibility. So random self-reducibility is uh, you want to compute the permanent of n by n matrices, not from smaller ones, but from random ones. Okay, so let me make this more precise. Suppose I gave you a program, C, a circuit or something, uh, which, which agrees with permanent almost everywhere. You know, it uh, makes may very few errors, maybe you know, <coughs> 1 over 8n here. Okay, so it, it makes very few, but maybe substantial number. Okay? Uh, so you know that it works almost everywhere. And what do you want to do? I mean, think of it as a real program, and uh, it's a real challenge. You know, you have a faulty program. How do you check that it does what it should on the input you care about, you know, maybe it's, uh, it's one of the errors. So you want to compute it for a particular, so here's all possible matrices, here is a small fraction in which this program errs, and you want it to, to compute the permanent of x. And you don't know whether x is, a, you know, is an error of this uh, program or not. What do you do? So it turns out for the permanent you can do something. There are problems for which there is nothing you can do, but for the permanent, you can do the following, you know, random self-reduction. You basically use interpolation. So you pass a random line, you pick another point y, you pass a random line uh, through x, so x, x and y, and uh, then you evaluate this uh, other points on the line. So you, what you are trying to get is a permanent of x from the permanence of other points. The reason, in principle, you should be able to do it is that, uh, you know, because the permanent is a polynomial of degree n, if you think of uh, this auxiliary polynomial, g of t is, uh, you know, uh, what, whatever the circuit computes on, this, on each one of these points, uh, you can hope it's a permanent, and then it's a low degree polynomial in one variable, and then so you can interpolate the value at zero from the values in all others, why is this going to work? Because all the other, each one of the other points is individually random in space. So the probability that it's an error is that small, and there are only n or n plus one points you test it on. So with very high probability, there is no error on the other points, and then you interpolate and get the value of the uh, permanent on the point you cared about, even though there were errors. So what happened here is that if the permanent can be efficiently computed on most inputs, uh, then it can be computed efficiently with high probability on all inputs. That's what's called a random self-reduction. And if you think about the contrapositive of this, you see that if the permanent is hard in the worst case, it's also hard on average. And uh, this kind of reduction is, is hugely important, uh, as I'll show you in a second. Uh, it works not just for permanent, it works for any multivariate low-degree low polynomial, and uh, it gives rise to this... Uh, Arithmetization technique, and uh, I'm not going to show you this, but I just I will uh, show you only one thing here. Uh, just claim that this was hugely important in getting uh, low bound results, uh, getting the randomization results, and uh, implications to probabilistic proofs, which I'm going to talk about next. So again. This type of property is known for the permanent, is known for other functions, but not for all functions. We don't know whether NP-complete problems have this property, you know, whether we can reduce, uh, you know, uh, uh, a particular instance to a set of random instances. We don't know, and uh, actually we suspect the answer is no. So it's very special in this sense, and this speciality is very useful. So once this was understood, there was an avalanche of, uh, of results of, uh, in uh, computational complexity of uh, using the, both these uh, nice properties of uh, the permanent and then other polynomials. And I'm not going to go through this uh, list of amazing results. They are very important. They talk about uh, uh, interactive proofs and uh, probabilistically checkable proofs. Some people know this. Uh, I'll just uh, tell you about this one. So, 
interactive proofs for the permanent, and I have to explain what are interactive proofs. So I'm going back to a very basic uh, uh, definition, which is uh, critical for all mathematics, you know, verification of proofs of theorems. Uh, the general setting, uh, you know, for all of us really, is how do we convince other people that we solve the problem? Uh, there is uh, the way, good way to think about it is that there is uh, some prover who actually knows, you know, found the proof or thinks uh, he or she found the proof. And there is a skeptical verifier who is not as clever but uh, wants to check the correctness of this. And uh, the normal notion of uh, proof is what is, is really what's captured by NP. It's just uh, the way we, we uh, uh, work in mathematics, we just, we have a proof, we write it down and send it to a journal. And then, uh, you know, a referee can uh, verify it. So these are theorems that have short written proofs. That's a normal notion of provability. Interactive proofs, so this is a sound and complete uh, system if you write it, you know, formally. Interactive proofs, uh, introduced by uh, Babai and by uh, um, uh, Goldwasser, Mikali, and uh, Rakov, um, are theorems, so it's a more general notion of proof. It's uh, theorems that have fast, interact, probabilistic, interactive proof. So this is more, not like the journal model, but more like a you know, classroom model, where uh, a teacher would prove something uh, on the board, and then you know, there'll be questions asked, and, uh, you know, uh, he or she will have to reply with answers, and sort of it's an interaction. At the end of the interaction, what you hope is that, uh, you know, again, it's sound and complete, but you allow some error. So the questions can be random, answers can be random, and what you want to make sure is that it's very rare that uh, the prover can fool a verifier into believing something which is false. So that's the notion of interactive proof. And now, what it allows you to do is to you know, check theorems for which probably there is no short written proof. So I'm going to show you that the permanent, which for which we, you know, the, that the value of a permanent of a large matrix is something. I have no idea how to, you know, write a short proof for this. Okay, it seems like it needs an exponentially long proof. But it turns out that if you allow interactive proofs, uh, you know, you can, you can do it very efficiently, and I want to explain that. Good. Let me just say that uh, what we know after this result was proved, we know even much more, and there are, there are theorems that don't have short written proofs, uh, uh, which, which have such interactive proofs. And the, the best example I, I know is, uh, which is just a special case of what, what's known, is that suppose you know, a Martian or some being came to Earth and claimed that uh, they have a, a winning strategy for, let's say, for white in chess. How would you test this? I, mean, I, I think that if you're serious, especially those who like chess or go, whatever you prefer, uh, how would you test this? I mean, you know, we only can play as well as we can play. We have the theory books, but we don't have a complete understanding, and of course, the strategy is the, you know, the two, you know, even though it's a finite game, it's the, you know, the, writing down a, a winning strategy is something that will not hold enough space in the, you know, the universe is too small for such a description. So how can you, uh, well, it turns out that this, something similar to what I'm going to show you, would give any one of you a way to check such a claim, even though it doesn't have a short written proof. So, here the statement is that the permanent of some big matrix is something. Okay, so here we have the verifier, skeptical, and we have some untrusted prover who claims he knows permanent. Uh, and uh, you know the verifier is interested in a matrix of some n by n, uh, you know, permanent of some n by n matrix, and uh, the prover says, well, the answer is this, a1, a, a n. And how do you test this? So I'll use this notation, I'll uh, do zi uh, will, will be matrices of i by i. Okay, and all these numbers are numbers in the whatever field we are working on. Uh, so how do you check this? And it turns out that these downward and random self-reducibility properties are going to allow the verifier to 
to build a chain of matrices, okay, actually randomly, a, a sequence of matrices for which you will challenge the, the, the prover to give the value of the permanent. And after all is done, you know, uh, if the claim was true, it will be accepted. If the claim was false, it will be rejected with high probability. And so he's going to ask a question about a smaller n minus 1 by n minus 1 and get an answer, even smaller, get an answer, and all the way down. And the property of this sequence, uh, and I'll explain to you roughly how it's generated, the property of the sequence is that, you know, any claim implies the, you know, if, if, uh, if the i statement is correct, is true, then the i plus 1 statement, the one higher up, is true with very high probability, extremely high probability. And so the probability of uh, error in any one of these is tiny, so even in any one of them is tiny. And the main point is that, uh, you know, permanent of 1 by 1 matrices is pretty easy to compute. So this you can do yourself. And once you know that this is true, you know the second one is true, the third, and so on. So the original one was true. So how do you build this uh, sequence? So we already saw downward self-reduction, right? We saw that you can take an n by n matrix and translate it to n questions about n minus 1 by n minus 1 uh, matrices, permanents. Uh, that's, that, that's really too expensive because uh, if we continue this, it will go from n to n squared, so it will be exponential. So somehow, we'll see a variant of random self-reducibility that allows us to compress claims about n of them to, a to just a question about one. So let me show you that. So it's a twist of uh, random self-reducibility. We saw how to compute you know, one with very high probability for many. Now I want to show you how to verify many claims to reduce the verification of many claims to the verification of one claim, OK, about permanent. So uh, here again, this is the space of matrices. We have some K matrices about which we want to know the permanence of. And somebody, you know, we, you know was uh, claimed that the permanent value for all of them are these numbers. Okay. Now, what can we do? We want to reduce it to a question about one permanent. And uh, it's like, again, it will use interpolation. But now we, we have many claims. So instead of passing a line, we'll pass a curve. So we pick a, a, another random point and take the unique low degree, lowest degree polynomial, interpolating them all. Okay, and once we do that, we we challenge whoever the prover to to tell us what is the permanent, you know, of the of all points on the curve parameterized by, you know, the name of the point. It's a low degree polynomial. Because it's a low degree polynomial, what we are going to do now is just pick a random, one single random point on this curve, let's say x sub r, and challenge, you know, the, very, the prover to prove to us only this statement about that the permanent of this point is what it should be according to the polynomial he gave us. And it turns out that just by the virtue of having the, you know, low degree, the probability that uh, you know this will be what it should be, but one of these were wrong, is uh, is very small. If the field is large enough, much larger than it. So that's all you need. So using this combination of downward uh, and random self-reducibility and this compression, this verifier will generate the sequence of matrices leading to a one by one matrix which you can verify. So. As I said, this, uh, uh, this, is, this was just one result among a, a set of very important results in computational uh, complexity that allowed us to understand such classes as uh, uh, polynomial space and uh, non-deterministic exponential time, and also NP in a very different way using the famous PCP theorem. So <coughs> it was hugely important having this uh, permanent. Uh, and these properties, and its completeness, of course. OK, so questions so far? I'm switching again. Good. So I want to talk, the, the last two topics are, are short. I want to talk about the Boolean side of the thing and talk about, first of all, about the uh, uh, class sharp P, the class, the home of the permanent. 
Uh, this is everything you can do if you have an algorithm for the permanent. Uh, so I want to claim it captures natural counting problems. And what are, so beforehand in the arithmetic setting, we saw that it captures natural polynomials. Now in the Boolean setting, where you're talking about evaluating uh, polynomials, uh, uh, I want to claim that it captures basically all <coughs> interesting counting problems. So what are examples of some interesting counting problems? <laughs> Uh, count the number of satisfying assignments to a given formula. Count the number of clicks in a graph. Count the number of Hamiltonian cycles in a graph. Count the number of perfect matchings in a graph. That's a permanent function. Uh, count the number of linear extensions of a partially ordered set. Count the number of spanning trees, etc. So there are lots of them. Lots of them. And if you, if you think about them, what would be a general way to describe them, you'd think, uh, yeah, OK, oh, sorry, I have to uh, uh, say something important. Even though it's a long list, it's, uh, the, the problems, the first three and the last three, are very different from each other in the following sense. If you just consider the decision version, does there exist a satisfying assignment? Does there exist you know, a large click and so on? The first three are all NP-complete, whereas the last three, are all in P. So in terms of decision problem, they are very different. But what we'll see is that actually counting is a sort of a different creature. And it, it separates hard and easy in a different way than the decision problem. So if we wanted to classify all of them in some, in some nice framework, the obvious framework would be, you know, that, uh, which captures this class, sharp P. It's just a class of counting problems where the counting problem is how many accepting paths does a given non-deterministic machine have? Because you can easily set up a non-deterministic machine to guess satisfying assignments of you know, formulas, uh, clicks, and graphs, and so on. OK. And some of them are complete. So some of these uh, counting problems are complete for this class of counting problems. The most obvious ones are those that generalize from NP-complete problems. So the first three are easily shown and easily proven to be complete. And Valiant's uh, amazing intuition was that even though perfect matching, the decision problem is in P, the counting version is nevertheless sharp P complete. So that's a highly non-trivial uh, result, a reduction. And it was extended to other problems like, uh, like the problem, like this problem. And of course, it's not true for every counting problem. As I mentioned already in the beginning, if you want to count the number of uh, spanning trees in a graph, then it was already known to Kirchhoff that that reduces to a determinant computation. So that's an easy problem. It's not likely to be complete uh, for them. And in fact, there are, there are some other interesting examples that I want to mention. Uh, there are lots of polynomials in statistical physics and in the knot theory and in the uh, you know, graph theory. Uh, and it turns out that evaluating them, essentially at every point, almost except for very few sort of easy points, is Sharpie complete, as hard as the permanent. And so these questions arise in, in, in lots of different fields. Uh, so, so there's an enormous number of uh, counting problems, uh, uh, you know, and we, which, which encode, I don't know, evaluating uh, partition functions, estimating, you know, long range correlations and stuff like statistical physicists do, which, uh, which all you know, can be encoded into the permanent. Uh, one uh, other easy problem, actually, it's, uh, it's a beautiful algorithm, and it was invented by a physicist, by Kesselen, in the 60s, is that while counting perfect matching, while doing the permanent in general, uh, you know, in a general graph is hard, it shall be complete. If the graph is planar, it turns, turns out that this is an easy problem. It can be, can be solved efficiently by a reduction to determinant. And uh, I'm mentioning this particular problem because it leads to the next topic I want to talk about, that is quantum computing. And we'll see how it, uh, you know, how it features there. So what is the quantum computing? I'm not going to tell you. Uh, but here are the two important classes. So BPP is everything that can be efficiently computed using probabilistic algorithms. And BQP is everything that can be efficiently computed if you have a, you know, a quantum computer, a computer based on quantum mechanics. 
but I'm not going to define it. I'm sure many of you heard about it. And you know, the main question uh, is, uh, uh, there's an obvious containment here. The main question is whether you know, we can build quantum computers. But what, what would be the, well, you can build up a theoretical model, a quantum Turing machine or quantum circuit and ask what can it compute efficiently. And we don't know much, but uh, here are a few things we know. Uh, one, I mentioned in the beginning, everything that quantum computing can do can be done by the permanent. So it's not harder than that. Uh, but that's, well, that would be very hard, if, uh, very good if it, it was equal to this, uh, you know, if it had all this power. The, one of the only indications we have that, uh, that uh, quantum computers bias anything is this uh, very famous uh, result of Peter Shaw, showing that integer factorization can be done quickly on a quantum computer. Uh, I said here it's assumed not to be in BPP, when I say assumed, I mean you assume it, not I, because anybody here who uses their credit card on the internet is assuming that uh, factoring is hard. Uh, so, okay, so that's uh, some things we know. And the basic questions about quantum computation here, well, the main one, I, I guess, and the, I think hundreds of millions of dollars are already invested in this, in building. You know, can we build quantum computers? Uh, it's not clear yet. And the other thing is what their power. This is just a touch scratching the surface. And I want to go back to this uh, story of fermions and uh, bosons. So, you know, there are just two types of elementary particles. Fermions are the ones responsible for our bodies and are the floor of the, the, the buildings and, you know, materials. Electrons, for example, and so on. And uh, there are bosons, which are different type of particles. These are the carriers of force, or photons, for example. Uh, and you study in quantum mechanics, you know, the behavior or the, the distribution, the amplitude of, uh, amplitudes of uh, particles of this nature or this nature. And what you discover is that, uh, you know, the wave functions are described. I'm not, uh, that's not a precise formulation, of course. Wave function is described in this case by determinant and in this case by permanent. And given all I've told you so far, it should really be weird, right? It's weird that, uh, you know, nature seems to, well, that's how nature behaves. So, you know, in nature there are fermions, there are bosons, they all know what to do. So somehow they all can compute, you know, what they need, where they need to be. Uh, it's not so surprising that these guys can do it efficiently, but how can nature does this efficiently, do this efficiently? It's not clear, but at least it can be formulated. Uh, in this series of works, it turns out that if you, rest, if you define a quantum computer, a limited uh, subclass of quantum computers, which works only with fermions, uh, then it turns out that this uh, class of quantum machines is not more powerful than classical ones because they can be reduced to determinants. For those who know, these are the holographic algorithms of Valiant. And this depends on the result I mentioned before of Kesterlen that planar matching uh, counting is easy. On the other hand, if you look at bosons, then uh, uh, in this work, you know, they defined uh, bosonic computers and these uh, computers can sample the Permanent. So it seems like, you know, nature should allow us to not quite evaluate permanent, but sample permanent. So it's another demonstration, like shows factoring, that maybe there is a gap between, uh, between the two. Uh, okay, so I have about two minutes, and I have about two slides. Uh, uh, questions about this? Okay, so I'll tell you just very briefly, I'll just rush through it, but it's uh, just uh, another very important uh, point to make is that in some sense, you know, some questions about permanence are not so difficult, and this is approximating them if you have uh, non-negative matrices. So uh, even zero, you know, even zero one permanence, namely counting matchings in graphs uh, is, is, is hard, but suppose you don't want the exact count. You want it within 1% or within epsilon. 
Well, there is a very important, very famous algorithm of Jerome Sinclair. We got us saying this can be done. So permanent can be approximate of, of non negative any non-negative matrix can be approximated extremely well, as well as you want, in time polynomial in n and one over epsilon, the approximation guarantee, multiplicative approximation. And uh, it uses, uh, well, let me not talk about it. Uh, and I want to contrast it with the little we know about, yeah, so I, yeah, one thing I should have said is that this is a probabilistic algorithm, a Monte Carlo type algorithm. I want to end with an open problem about doing it deterministically. Again, you have a non-negative matrix, you want some approximation of the permanent of this matrix, and uh, you, you now you're not allowed to randomize. If you listened to the talk yesterday, you know that you, know, you should be able to do it, assuming some hardness, but suppose we don't, you know, we want the proof. Uh, the best we know is this result uh, that you can always approximate it to a factor e to the n. n is the dimension. You can have a deterministic algorithm that factors it within e to the n. It's very, well, it's very bad. Of course, the matrix can have arbitrary values, so it's, uh, and this factor of approximation does not depend on the entries. Uh, you may wonder where it comes from, and uh, there, are, there are basically two ingredients here. One is uh, this uh, famous law bound on the permanent of any doubly stochastic matrix. So if your matrix happens to be doubly stochastic, then of course its permanent is at most one, but this law bound, saying it's minimized where all the entries are one over n, is the famous uh, van der Waanden conjecture that was solved by Faritman and Gorichev. Uh, and uh, what it says is that if you want e to the n approximation, you don't have to work at all if your matrix happens to be doubly stochastic. You don't have to do anything. You say one. Okay. Uh, what do you do if the matrix is not doubly stochastic? Well, there, what we do here in this work is uh, show that you can always reduce to the doubly stochastic case using what's called matrix scaling, which I'm not going to describe. But the main open, oh, so, and there was a recent uh, improvement of e to the n improved to 2 to the n. And I'm really curious about just getting a sub-exponential, forget 1 plus epsilon approximation, getting sub-exponential approximation to the permanent of non-negative matrices. Thanks.